This is some quote from one of the um, beginning scientists in the scientific revolution. He was then followed by Descartes, Descartes and Newton that um, did some amazing things. And I'm not trying to kind of talk them down, but what they also partly contributed to was a move away from seeing ourselves as part of an interconnected web of life. And instead they zoomed in on the parts and they, they believed that everything had to be understood by, by uh, viewing the universe as a big clockwork, as a machine. And you could not understand things by looking at a whole system point of view. You needed to understand things by zooming in on the parts. So it was the beginning of a very reductionist mindset. And that mindset grew and then we entered the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution were to a great extent focused on extracting resources, not only natural resources, but also human resources. It was the beginning of the productivity era. Everything had to be as productive and efficient. We needed to optimize everything to the fullest. Um, that was also the beginning of uh, of hierarchies, of rigid hierarchies, and seeing the organization as a machine um, that had to be run like a, like a factory machine. This very mechanistic, rigid worldview of seeing an organization. And again, in this, this era brought many great strides. We've been to the moon, we have invented airplanes and whatnot, but it has also meant that we are now in the midst of a sixth mass extinction. Um, we are losing up to 1,200 species a day. We soon have more marine life, or we soon have more plastic in our oceans than we do marine life. We have cut 80% of our natural forest. We have lost 75% of our, of our flying insect population in the, in the past three decades. Things are not looking very bright. It is, we have been on what is called the great acceleration, but it's not only fertilizer, GDP, population growth, um, carbon dioxide emissions that have been on a steep increase. It's also our mental health and well being. The people that are supposed to lead us out of this crisis have never been more stressed and depressed and anxious than they are today. And this is affecting their ability of seeing things in an interconnected whole system point of view, where there's an understanding of when you create a system intervention in one part of the system, it will create either positive or negative ripple effects. We know from neurobiology that when you are in a high beta brainwave, which is evolutionary, incredibly brilliant, because that was the brainwave that enabled us to survive. So that is why we are still around. But it's also the brainwave that means that when we are in a high beta brainwave mode, we get tunnel vision, all our energy goes to solving that problem alone. We become less compassionate. We only have focus on what's immediately at hand or in front of us. And we become careless about what is not immediately in front of us. And the problem is that when the majority of people on this planet are spending too much time in that mode, it is affecting our mental health and well-being, our corporate cultures. And we need to create an awareness about the interconnectedness of, of, um, of stress and friction in our systems right now, because it is creating negative ripple effects throughout systems if we are not addressing that in a holistic manner, where we are not just solving things here and there, but are look at, looking at things in a holistic way. So you could ask yourself the question why the most intelligent primate on this planet is deliberately, because we do know this, destroying their own habitat. And I believe that there are, there are many answers, but if we narrow them down, it's all about the story of separation that we have been through. We have been through a journey of separation where we have separated ourselves from our natural habitat. We thrive in nature, but unfortunately, we have uh, stripped that natural habitat away. Most of us only spend time in nature, maybe if we're lucky, Sunday afternoon when we go for a stroll in the park or um, a hike, if we are lucky. Um, but we are not immersing ourselves in nature to the extent that we should be to increase our mood, our well-being, our creativity, our compassion 
we are nature, but we are, have forgotten our connection with nature. Not only our inner nature, but also the outer nature that is surrounding us and is part of our planet. Then there's been a separation between the feminine and the masculine, and it, it started uh, way back. It started also with the witch hunts of causing this division and this chasm between the masculine and the feminine. And I'm not just talking genders here, but this prioritization and this celebration of masculine traits that also female executives has to a great extent uh, taken upon themselves. The first 10 years of my leadership career when I was in my 20s and early 30s, I definitely tried to morph into a man as much as I could because that was seen as, as being more professional and then you were taken seriously. We have degraded and we look down at the feminine traits and that is causing great harm for not only women but also men. We need to make sure that we celebrate both the feminine and the masculine within us, in our corporate cultures, in our societies. And it's to a great extent, if you look at some of the feminine tra traits to the right hand sides, that are so that's some of the traits that we really, really need right now on the next kind of um, face of, of homo sapiens in living on this planet, if we want to stick around um, for the longer term. There's also been a separation between the inner and the outer. We have not been taught to listen to our inner self. We have been taught to live up to an outer ideal of what success means. We have not been taught to cultivate our own inner ecosystems, as well as we have very little knowledge about the ecosystems upon which our survival depend. So for us to heal the current friction and stress in our societies, we need to heal the division between the inner and the outer and start exploring our own inner emotional landscapes and stand strong in that if we want to lead successfully going forward. And, the, and, the, and to a great extent in my field of sustainability, I mean, the discussion is so dominated by the right kind of technologies we need to scale, the right kind of financial mechanisms to be, be impl implemented, um, the right kind of policy framework, but very little discussion around inner sustainability. How do we cultivate um, organizations, education systems, um, or conferences where inner sustainability is celebrated as, as much as outer sustainability. We need this holistic, holistic approach for us to move forward successfully. The fourth kind of area where we have separated ourselves and where we need to continue to, we need to focus on, on reconnecting uh, of the two elements that has been separated is the division between the left brain hemisphere and the right brain hemisphere. The left brain hemisphere is brilliant at thinking in logical, rational terms, making structure, um, focusing on the parts, and, and, and also create a bit of polarization, black and white, you and me. Um, whereas the right brain hemisphere, that's where our genius in terms of creativity, interconnectedness, relational, um, and, and, and understanding things uh, as a whole lies. But we have, again, celebrated the, the left brain hemisphere instead of the right brain hemisphere. And we need to be aware of that. And we need to cultivate our right brain hemisphere qualities to a much greater extent, celebrate those. So for us to move forward, um, we need to focus on, on, em on embarking on a journey of reconnection. We need to be aware where we are showing up, um, mainly in our masculine, or maybe living our lives based on outer values or where we could draw more on nature's intelligence, which I will get back to when we've had a little sharing. Um, how can we draw more on, on the logic of life and the intelligence and wisdom of nature? So those four areas, we need leaders that have an awareness around how do I create cultures that are celebrating the reconnection of these areas. So before I dive deeper, let's take a few minutes where you in your own space reflect on these two questions. So where and how does the story of separation show up in your life? And how could you play a role in the journey of reconnection? The story of separation shows up in every 
arena in life right now. And that's why we need change agents from every arena in life. Um, this is not just a leadership agenda. We are all leaders in our own life and we need to step up. Um, so uh, this is a slide I forward from my friend Daniel Christian Ra that has written an, an, a, a great book uh, that some of you will probably know about, um, Designing Regenerative Cultures. But, but this is just to show you that um, right now there's a lot of excitement around the SDGs and many companies are using them as a, as a measure and as a, as a narrative and a framework and that's great and brilliant. Um, but to, to a great extent, um, sustainability, um, what is it that we want to sustain? Do we want to sustain what we have right now? I believe we need to focus on regenerating, revitalizing, restoring, healing the ecosystems, both inner and outer, um, that we have caused great havoc to the past um, few centuries. So we need a new approach. We need to advance our thinking from just sustaining and doing less harm um, to actually healing um, every uh, system that our organization, community, our life is, uh, is interacting with and have that awareness that every action, um, even if it's a smile to a stranger on the street or our grocery sh shopping or our strategy processes, uh, corporate culture, everything is creating ripple effects far beyond what we can see and sometimes even imagine. Um, and that's why we need more ecosystemic thinkers, which I will get back to. So um, the book that I have co-authored with uh, Giles Hutchins is, um, it came about because we were both researching pioneers, pioneers that were uh, breathing and living the regenerative DNA. Um, so we merged our research and we put the pieces together and made a big deal out of making sure that this framework were not silo based. So we included perspectives and research and insights from experts within sociology, anthropology, psychology, biology, physics, economy, including uh, concepts like the circular economy, biomimicry, permaculture, etc. To do our best to create an, a, a, an interconnected holistic framework uh, that, was, that was accessible to leaders. And I will conclude this day with a presentation of that DNA framework so that hopefully you will be inspired to, to use that in your life in, in whatever way is possible. So the guiding principles of these pioneers were quite interesting. They were all, to some extent, leaning on the intelligence of living systems, leaning on the intelligence of life, leaning on the intelligence of 3.8 billion years of experience, um, and tapping into that in how they design goods and services, their corporate culture, um, their meeting cultures, how they were living their lives. Um, so we narrowed those down into three principles that I will just dive a bit more into so you get a sense of them. The first principle is that everything in life has to create the principles conducive for more life to thrive and flourish. Um, that's how nature works. Nature is not creating environments where a uh, future generation will not be able to survive. So constantly nature is creating delicious soil for more plants to grow, evolve and, and be nourished. Um, so a concept like the circular economy is, is, is one critical component of creating life affirming production cultures. Um, a company like Interface is just an, one of many great examples um, you probably know of Interface, if not, they have a standard of, of, of making sure that all their production facilities, it's a carpet company, by the way, uh, that all their production facilities and uh, headquarters and office spaces, they have to mimic based on the principles of a forest, of an ecosystem. So the factories has to turn sunlight into energy, purify water, use regenerative materials. Um, and they have this ecosystemic approach where they make sure that they empower everyone in their stakeholder web. Um, so they, of course, for example, pay fishermen in, in, um, in Singapore and the Philippines to fish discarded fishing nets and use that plastic to produce the fibers of their carpets. Um, in, in, and, and, and just one small regenerative way of, of creating regenerative vitality in your ecosystem that is also making business sense. And Interface is doing very, very well from a financial perspective as well, since they made this decision to go all in on regeneration. 
um, a case you should all dive into if you, if you haven't come across that. Then life is ever changing and responsive. So um, a, a school of fish or a flock of birds or a beehive and antel, they have these uh, feedback mechanisms. They are incredible at being resilient and at adapting to change to niches. There are 14,000 species or versions of, of, of ants in the world that have through time adapted to different climates. Um, what can we learn from superorganisms? What can we learn in terms of how they tap into the collective intelligence of their superorganism uh, super to quickly adapt to change? Um, more companies can learn from that and especially, I mean, it's never been uh, a, to some extent better to be a systems thinker than, that, than now during a global pandemic. It's very easy to explain how things are creating ripple effects, something that happened potentially at a market in China has now caused great negative ripple effects throughout the whole planet. Um, so how can we adapt to change? How can we mimic a uh, super organism in our, in our organizational designs and how can we understand that, um, that it's, it's not the strongest, the loudest alpha male that necessarily stick around. Charles Darwin was to a great extent misinterpreted. He, he never said survival of the fittest as in the strongest alpha male, but that's how we have translated that. What he meant that it's the, it's the species that are best able to collaborate and adapt to changing environments that get to stick around. How can we learn from that? How can we learn from living systems in our organizational design that um, that these rigid hierarchies, they lose their elasticity, their, their vitality, their uh, resilience and their responsiveness. They, they don't have these uh, dynamic feedback loops where um, every cell in the organism feels empowered and knows exactly what to do in, 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 in case A happens, we know we do B. Um, in case of, I mean, they are um, brilliant at adapting to quick changing environments. And, and we see more and more organizations actually mimicking, mimicking these living systems through self-organizing principles, to tapping into collective intelligence, never let strategy processes be run by the executive team alone, but make it be an empowered process where you tap into the gold and the richness of everyone in your ecosystem, not just employees, but also suppliers and competitors and, and customers, of course. Um, much more about all these things in the book, of course, I'm just giving you a little appetite. So live is also um, thriving thanks to its relations and thanks to the interconnectedness of these relationships. So the mycelium on the ground is constantly transporting delicious nutrients um, in, in very large distances and, and can quickly detect um, where the forest needs more uh, water or where it needs specific nutrients. It's a collaborative uh, web of life on the ground. Um, and, uh, and someone just before mentioned the work of Fritjof Capra and he very beautifully uh, have a visualization of um, to the left hand side you see an image of death and to the right hand side you see an image of life. Life is really dependent on the vitality of the, of the relationships in your living system. So if the relationships are um, communicating poorly, if it's dominated by a lot of stagnant energy, a lot of friction, that living system um, will slowly wither and die. So how can we pay more attention to not just the departments and the elements which we are so trained to look at immediately, but instead shift our perception to look at the relationships. How is the relationship of my ecosystem? We cannot understand the world in fragmented parts. We cannot make a diagnosis of where to enter and make a system intervention if we don't look at the system as a whole, if we don't look at the human body as a whole and include psychology, uh, where is that person coming from that's the only way for us to make an assessment of what to do in specific under, in specific situation by having the whole backdrop um, of history and and having this whole system perspective so one of the things that 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 i teach a lot is to train um leaders executives um, but also students 
Um, this is something you could, you could also train a five-year-old to look at the world as a great ecosystem. So map everything in your life that is alive to you. One way of structuring it could be to the right-hand side, you put your, all the inner elements of your ecosystem. And to the left-hand side, you put the outer elements. So if this was an organization, um, in, on, on the right-hand right side, you would have the relationship between the different departments, uh, some of the keystone species those people that stand out more um, and to the right or to the left hand side you would have stakeholders politicians media and then map start to map what is the relationship between all those elements and um, are these relationships and this these connections are they thriving are they stagnant and um, and how could you start to apply the mindset of a chief ecosystemic officer so not a CEO in in in, in the traditional sense but a CEO that has the ability to think uh, in ecosystem and has that ability to listen listen to what goes on on the ground you cannot leap from the top down you need to listen to the ground you need to understand where people are coming from for you to make a positive system intervention so where are the key flows where are the nodal points where you can start to make an intervention where are uh, the stagnant energy or and where can you enhance your system systems restorative powers that's really that that's the kind of thinking that we need more of regardless of where we are based so uh, an example of a negative system um, intervention that create a lot of negative potentially ripple effects is the introduction of pesticides if we don't have the awareness of where those pesticides are going that they actually end up in the food that we eat it ends up in our um, in our human bodies um, or in medicine that we uh, inject without having an understanding of the side effect through the whole body or another example could be financial aid to refugee camps if we don't have an understanding of how that capital in, is employed and is there a regenerative way of, in, of applying finance so that you enable and empower regenerative change um, something we can we can get more back to in the in the discussions but how can we make sure we make truly regenerative systems interventions the fourth point is that life bangs and thrive thanks to diversity so monoculture is um, is how we create suffering ecosystems that um, that will wither, wither and turn into deserts we need to make sure that we are creating um, ecosystems where we in, in permaculture we have the concept of the edge effect where two cultures are collide, colliding it can be the coral reef or the mangrove forest that's where we have the most richness in terms of species in terms of aliveness vitality Imagine if executives knew that and, uh, and dared to lead example by allowing as much rich, richness and diversity into the living systems. Most people shy away from that uh, because it feels more safe and comfortable to uh, employ people that reminds you of yourself. Um, but we need to train executives to reveal the golden nuggets, that tension that will inevitably arise when, when cultures are colliding. There's a lot of delicious um, new emergence um, that does arrive when, uh, in, when we are in, in able to, to sit with the tension of diversity and, and reveal that, um, that delicious um, new energy that comes with uh, with the vitality of, of many species around in the same location. Another element is that life thrives thanks to seasons. So life is never going through a nonstop spring and summer, yet we have created societies that falsely believe we have to be in a constant spring and summer for us to be successful. Um, but to restore our superpowers, we need to learn to lean into the darkness of the winter, to lean into the restorative, regenerative energy of an autumn and a winter, integrate our learnings, um, make sure that we can come back for the next sprint, for the next spring, um, with, our, with our superpowers restored and revitalized. 
And how can we do that in our daily lives? We can do that in a way where we go about our days, when we ensure we have the energy of each season we presented. That's something that I live strongly by. Um, that, for example, after this call or just leading up to it, I will make sure that I don't come directly from another meeting or an intense discussion, but I will have had the time to be in nature. It's easy for me when I live on a permaculture farm, but just kind of implementing those small pockets of silence and solitude throughout your day. Some companies do this by introducing a minute of silence at the end and the and the and the and the closure of a meeting just to restore the energy and not having this constant friction of nonstop talking um, and, and ego easily slipping in when we don't have that time to retreat and restore. So the last kind of element is um, is how we can make sure that there's a constant input and output of, of energy and matter. So ecosystems thrive thanks to a constant input of minerals and water and nutrients and, and sun energy. And, and, and that are, that's the elements that can create a delicious output. And we as ecosystemic regenerative leaders need to have this awareness that we need the delicious input for us to create thriving output. So having that constant awareness is incredibly important. Um, so based on this, the regenerative DNA, the logic of life is embedded in that throughout the DNA framework. Um, but before we dive into that, I would like to again stop for a while and leave you with a minute of, uh, of silence and just reflect a bit about how could you draw more on this intelligence, this logic of life, and maybe to help you, I can scroll all the way back to the, to the overview of these principles. So where could you in your life draw more on, on these principles in your life, in your leadership, whatever is your context? And let's have a few minutes of silence and we will discuss that. I think we will move on now um, to make sure we have time to um, dive a little into the DNA framework. Um, sorry, I have to fast forward here. So the DNA framework is based on, on this logic of life. That is the foundation. Um, but then we have done our best um, to make sure that it becomes an easy accessible tools for leaders and even school teachers to to teach and use as a framework and and even an, an assessment vehicle um, and for those that are interested I we can we could briefly touch on how you use this as as a framework for running organizations so it just it sits on the logic of life um, and then it consists of three main elements living systems design which is how you produce your goods and services living systems culture how do you make sure you create uh, cultures that are rich and full of vitality and and thrivability and third the third element is living systems being which is all about these human qualities that we need to nurture more there's two rhythmical pulsating energies moving through the dna which is leadership dynamic and life dynamics that is important for us to understand so let's unfold these a bit it's an oscillating energy between having great self-awareness and great systemic awareness and as leaders and human beings we need to have that constant dynamic between understanding ourselves understanding how we infuse systems what are our shadows our bias um, our triggers are, how we show up in the world, um, in a great combination with understanding systems. We need more systems thinkers that have that ability of knowing that when I do something here, it will create a ripple effects um, in many other systems. So that oscillating energy is what we call the regenerative leadership consciousness. That is an important energy for us all to integrate. The other dynamic for us to understand is the basis of how life and new ideas emerge. And that is an oscillating energy between convergence and divergence that then creates 
new emergence and what does that mean so divergence is that energy of experimenting of trying out new new things getting input from the field exploring um making sure you diversity you, you diversify your inputs by including different kinds of stakeholders maybe you create a, or host a hackathon to get ideas from different perspectives into a new product development or whatever that could be but that has to be in combination with the energy of convergence, where you ground your input, where you integrate, where you consolidate. If not, your thinking and your approach will be constantly all, all, all over the place, constantly moving on to the next thing, if you're not grounding and consolidating. And if you're only being in the convergent energy, you're not getting the, the rich input from the field that you should in terms of emerging and involving and advancing to the next level. So that oscillating energy is incredibly important as well. Then we have living systems design. How do you produce your goods and services? And what principles should our production line be based on? You need to incorporate a circular economy, biomimicry, use regenerative materials, having this understanding of biophilic design, which means we, uh, we design our corporate um, office spaces, our homes, to ensure that there's a greater connection to us and our natural habitat. So we include elements from nature and how we design cities, buildings, office spaces, et cetera. So we have sound from nature. We can look at nature, images of nature. We can, our senses can touch elements and fabric from nature. Ecosystemic design thinking is that understanding of, 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 of thinking in systems. Then we have the element of living systems culture. What are the main DNA strands when we talk about rich regenerative cultures? Um, we need to make sure that we survive and thrive and there needs to be a financial baseline for us to thrive in the future, at least in an interim space. There are a lot of regenerative thinkers that believe everything has to be based on on a gift economy. I don't think we are there just yet. Um, we need a strong mission and movement and the mission and values and the movement is, um, is that cohesive energy that brings the culture together. Um, we need a culture that is developmental and respectful, that can hold a safe space for people's development. So we don't feel we have to wear a mask when we go to work, but we can be fully ourselves. And there's a safe space for us to do that. And we take responsibility of not only our own growth and development, but also those of our colleagues. Mm -hmm. We need to include diversity and inclusion. We need to include more self-organizing principles to tap into the rich creativity and innovation that lies dormant in many departments right now because there's not a process for letting that surface. And then we need to celebrate and teach our employees and our leaders to facilitate ecosystemic dialogues. Um, and the third element is all about how we show up as human beings. Are we present? Are we in alignment with our inner values? Are we speaking our truth? Do we dare to be who we truly are? Or are we, as I said before, wearing a mask or trying to morph into society's vision of how we should be a success in the outer world? Are we patient with ourselves and our colleagues and our partners? Are we, allow, are we allowing life to unfold without forcing things forward in a way that often creates a, a lot of friction and a hectic energy that can be very destroying? Are we tapping into an, ab an abundant mindset or are we more in tune with a fear-based scarcity mindset where we believe we can't all, all win, where we believe that someone is out to get us and will steal our ideas, so we better run with it um, and make sure we get all the credit? Are we in, in integrating, integrating silence into our lives or are we shying away and are we actually dreading silence um, a, a small little uh, segue uh, my personal story with silence i was forced um, to surrender to to silence and i gave a TED talk about about that journey because i suffered a minor traumatic brain injury injury five years ago and i had to cultivate a love for silence because that was the only thing i could i could function in because i couldn't i couldn't my mind couldn't 
digest any output or input. I couldn't read or write or talk or anything. But that's a long story. But it, but it's important that we are allowing that kind of moment of silence for things to integrate and us to constantly connect with our inner core. Dance means this cyclical and rhythmical approach to life of allowing every energy of every season into our into our lives and as you can probably guess there's a lot more to these three elements this is just kind of an upfront presentation that you can dive more into in your own space um, but this is really all about the dna framework is really all about a tool to um, to advance us all towards the journey of reconnecting and bringing together, reclaiming the pieces that we have lost as a collective on our, on our journey to, through time. So how can we collectively make regenerative leadership the new norm? How can we implement this DNA framework? Um, in the book, there's, a, there's the way that you can use it as an assessment in your organization is it, it comes with a set of detailed questions that you then address and answer and you give yourself points and you then color out it can be questions like my organization embraces the principles of a circular economy and cradle to cradle and to what extent is, is that true and you give yourself point and you do that for all 17 dna strands we don't have the time to unfold those in detail but just to give you a sense that this is not just a framework this is something that can be deeply integrated into your organization and that's how um, executives and organizations are using this um, it's often used as a tool for seminars and workshops because it's allowed for really rich discussions around to what extent are we regenerative? And then they color out the DNA assessment wheel and it allows a visual overview of where are they performing really well and where do we have room for improvement? So um, I would like to finish off Sorry for this tour de force into a very complex framework, but this is just really an appetite. Um, we don't have time to unfold it. It's some, something that I normally unpack in a, a, over many kind of sessions. So, um, so let's just see this as an appetizer and rather make time um, for us to share in the, in the final um, 10 minutes we have left, how we can all collectively make this approach um regenerative leadership the new norm what do you think are the important next steps and what could you do leaving this session and what could you start to do differently that's something i am very curious to understand or learn more about i would like to um, thank all of you for for showing up um, and contributing to a rich energy and and hope that you are up for closing um, our sharings the same way that we started, but just um, a minute of, of silent and, and tuning into gratitude for all of us showing up and being these imaginal cells of, uh, of a new transformation. So close your eyes and take a few deep breaths in through the nose and out through the mouth. And just visualize that if this conversation were showing on a visual map of the entire planet, that we would have little light bulbs popping up all over the planet because we are calling in from, from many different countries. And that we are living through a fascinating metamorphosis. And that can sometimes hurt feel confusing, overwhelming, but there's always cracks of light. And for us to feel empowered and alive, we can leave this call and, and look for those cracks of light and, and representing those cracks in our own behavior and how we show up in this world. So I'm immensely gratitude, gratitude, grateful for all of you showing up and spending time with us today and, and hope we will connect in the future. So I'll hand over the word to the organizers and thank all of you and hopefully see you all again.